This episode of the Sacred Sons podcast is brought to you by ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a monthly subscription service that delivers high quality meats right to your doorstep. At Sacred Sons, we understand the importance of fueling our bodies with real organic food and that nourishment is essential for an embodied life. ButcherBox makes it easy. Their beef is 100% grass-fed and grass-finished, their chicken is free-range and organic, and their pork is heritage breed and raised with care. Not only is ButcherBox's meat of the highest quality, but they also prioritize sustainable and ethical farming practices. Their commitment to responsible sourcing means you can feel good about the meat that you're putting on your plate. I know that those of us that have families, having these quality foods is of the utmost importance. And it's incredibly convenient. Their monthly subscription model means you always have a supply of high quality meat on hand without having to worry about making trips to the grocery store. Our family has been ordering from ButcherBox for years. A couple of our favorites are the ribeye, put those bad boys on the grill, and the baby back ribs, slow cooked in the oven for four hours. It's a little bit of barbecue sauce. Hits the spot. And as a special offer right now, you can get free bone-in chicken thighs with your order and $20 off your first box. Nourish your body and mind with high-quality meats delivered to your doorstep from ButcherBox. Visit ButcherBox.com to learn more and take advantage of these limited-time special offers. Much love, fam. Grand Rising Soul Family, Adam Jackson here with another episode of the Sacred Sons Podcast. Today, we are coming at you live from Leadership Training Summit near Orlando, Florida. And I'm honored to bring through my brother and fellow Sacred Sun facilitator, Hunter Torin. Welcome, my brother. This so is good a to be here, bro. Big blessing to be sitting here with you today. Oh my God. Uh, I just want to acknowledge, we've become somewhat of a gift-giving culture. So we've wrapped up our leadership training. Uh, we got the seeds, we got the acorns, and uh, if you want to know more about what that's about, come out to leadership training. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful gift. And with that, it is a gift to have you here today. It's my man's birthday. And so we're, we're blessing each other up with our presence. And thank you for being here. And I can't wait to dive in with you. And with that, our guest today, he's a movement therapist. He's a somatic counselor. He's a men's work facilitator. He's a ceremonialist and a song carrier. And he is a guardian of the Hawthorne medicine. Please welcome Hunter Torin. Hey, man. I'm going to be here with you, brother. <laughs> you know, three years later, here we are. Here we are three years later, from the seed to the mighty oak, my brother. Mm. So I first met you in Maui. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, I'm already getting teary-eyed. <laughs> <laughs> We first met in Maui. Where were you at? Where were you, where were you at when you first came into the Suns? Yeah, man. You know, I, I was alone. I had my family, and I had the responsibility of that. But I just moved to a city. I was a stranger in a strange land. Mm. And I had really reached a point in my own development. I'd reached a door, and it was like in big letters on it. You may not come through alone. And I heard your call, man, mm. you know? And I heard it, you know, calling all lone wolves. And it, it wasn't like you were talking to anyone else but me. You know, wow. it, it just struck that chord. And I'm like, yeah, that's me, you know? Wow. And um, I came with curiosity and a, a willingness to listen to young brothers, mm. you know? And to get, try and get out of my own way. I was in uh, chronic pain, physically. Wow. And uh, yeah, just ready to see what spirit had in store for me. Yeah. 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 So I remember those moments. I remember we had tent ceremony. I remember we sang by the waterfall, mm. activated the voice, and we had this really special moment, you know, for you to have a process and, and kind of a, a rebirth. Yeah. A rebirth. And here we are, years later, back on your birthday, we've recreated this, this really sacred moment. You showed up alone. What did you, what did you walk away with? 
I walked away with a somatic knowing of what support felt like. What it, what it felt like to receive from a conglomerate of brothers who were pulling in the same direction. Yeah. You know? I, I knew what it felt like to be seen in my totality, to be, you know, honored in my strengths and to be supported in what needed support within me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned the physical pain. Mm. I know that was very real for you. Yeah. And, you know, we have our brother Pasha. We got our brother Kale. We got Marco mm. bringing through that real physical recalibration. You know, and so you stepped into something. You know, I'm saying you're a, you're a movement therapist. You're a somatic counselor. You came with some tools as well. Yeah. Um, what was it like to get back in your body mm. at that at that time and at this stage in your life? Yeah, in that way too. Um, you know, it was uh, humbling. You know, for sure, getting in the gym with all these these jack guys. <laughs> you know, all these young cats and. Uh, you know, I was real good at getting other people out of pain, but wasn't able to return that medicine to myself. I was able to move outside of myself in a way we can get into uh, later, but I really believe that, you know, this, this uh, primal reset, this functional patterns is, is, a, is a key to awakening the mind-body in a way that allows this ancient future to come forward. Yeah. You know? Uh, Say more about that. Say more about, like, how the physical realignment in your experience was related to the the mental emotional and spiritual alignment because i think that's important for other brothers to hear power centers you know glutes <sighs> you know and looking at what had become leaky in my life and to to reel in and and to put strength where strength belongs and to bring myself back into the ratios of expansion and contraction to be that mirror of nature yeah again as a physicality and uh, to see myself reflected more deeply in the world, everything began to, to come into place as that confidence came back mm. in my movement and my strength. Um, yeah, it, it was, it was, a, it was a, a stepping stone to many things. Yeah. You know, uh, we say uh, flow becomes form and, and form becomes function. So presented with this flow that became a new form of me, just like water carving the land, there were new functions available to me, you know, and this, this great question of what is the function of a human being yeah. just became more clear. What is the function of a human being? When I think about that question for you, I think about how you honor the earth. And I think of this medicine called Hawthorne. Hey. To be a steward of, of a sacred plant medicine, that's the function. Yeah. And so how did this medicine show up in your life? I, I just want to say, you know, there's, we've talked many times about plant medicines. I just had Fabian on, we talked about Aya, mm -hmm. and you know, we've, we've talked about other things. But this is a really sacred and special medicine that you hold dear and that you introduced to our community. So yeah. could you just tell us a little bit about the, the, what it means to be a guardian and a carrier of Hawthorne? Yeah, you know, in Maui, I saw how you and the brothers, and particularly Kale, would set a table, you know? Yes. How you hosted, prepared the space, you know, putting prayers up before you mm. even knew who we were, you know, <sighs> calling us in in that way. And I really saw it as, uh, as the turning inside out of an individuality. And I knew there was so much in me that wanted to host that I had kept secret, like as a magician in the tower, and I'd come out and work mysteriously and go back to my tower. You know, yeah, were you like, you're, you're holding ritual and ceremony, but it's in isolation yeah. for, your, for self. For self. And there's, there's time and space for that yeah, too. Absolutely. I really, you know, had the, the opportunity to grow up in a mystical tradition um, uh, called, you know, uh, the Society of Friends or the Quakers. And ah. so I had given, been given that seed of what silence is, this thick substance that's full of support, you know? It's really called the Society of Friends? Yeah. I never heard that before. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> that's what Quakers are? Yeah. It's just a Society of Friends? Yeah. Damn. The Society of Friends. Quakers was actually um, kind of a slur that journalists 
uh, gave the society because they would quake. You know, there's no preacher. Everyone is a deliverer of the message. And they knew when they quake, just like we look for quiver. That's what we were looking for. So, you know, that's there the I quiver. am. Yeah, eight, nine years old, I'm seeing people quaking, you know. And uh, even as a rascal, there was no way I was breaking that silence, you know. Um, wow. So, yeah, you know, the prayer was simple, you know. Um, and it was to the land directly. Kale really opened up something in me with this idea of orphan wisdom. Mm. And there's like a radical authenticity in that. You know, I see so many people who want to borrow from tradition and it's, it's good to imitate until you can strip away until what's authentic within. But I really, being in a new place, felt I had an opportunity to introduce myself, you know, not as a king, not as the magician, but as the orphan who was, who was looking mm. again for a mother and a father to guide me yeah. uh, to learn to set a table. Yeah. And, you know... Um, and so Hawthorne, does it grow in the Pacific Northwest? It does. Yeah. Because I had noticed this place in this park that's near me, uh, this place, Magnuson Park. It's a pretty expansive uh, old naval base. And I, I could never find it again when I looked. And there was a lot of Hawthorne, and it was kind of drawing my attention a little bit. And uh, so I'd gotten those prayers up, and one day I'm just down there, and, you know, Eagle Clan, Kale yeah. representing. Chat, and chat. This eagle screams, comes over. I'm like, I'm just going to follow. <laughs> follow the eagle? <laughs> follow the eagle. <laughs> and sure enough, led me right to this meadow um, wow. full of hawthorn, which uh, began a process of questioning, you know, and trying to live in question. And curiosity. And curiosity and willingness um, to see what was there and try not to implement my will, but just wait, you know. And, uh, you know, it starts simple. One thorn under my pillow, you know? Um, mm. Just listen and wait. You know, there are many, many signs and uh, until it took about a year for it to begin to unfold. And I, and I, I've, I began to realize that this is an opportunity to uh, create a portal of remembrance. Because, yeah. you know, to me, the function of the human being right now is to remember who they are. Absolutely, you know? absolutely and that we can live into a progression of remembrance that brings us closer to that out of curiosity, not by declaring, but continuously asking. Yeah. You know? And in that, I like, I like how you kind of said that. It's asking in a way of not questioning it, not in a space of like knowing the unknown, but of just deep curiosity. Yeah. Like this is a, this is a good place to come from for seekers. Yeah. And I, uh, I didn't allow myself to Google anything, you know? Um, wow. Once it felt solid, it was really about um, showing up, just like we asked men to do here, just show up. Did it take you a year before you brewed it into a tea? Uh, it took about six months to brew it for the first time. All right. Um, you know, but it was, uh, it was not only asking without, but also within this path of the ancestors, which is a path of the blood, right? These waters that course through us and water being the, the seed of memory, you know, just listening for what was already in me that was drawing me to this. Um, and how warm my heart felt every time I sat in this place, uh, open and humble. Yeah, it sounds like you, you almost did a dieta with it, like by having it under the pillow mm -hmm. and just like having a slow uh, relationship with it. I did, yeah. My first challenge to myself was 33 dawns uh, in this place. Not consecutive, um, but to intentionally show up in, in the pitch black and watch day dawn in this place. And, uh, and uh, on the 33rd day, the, you know, the rising song, the mama song, came in completion. Um, Whoa. You know, as a gift. And that felt like the permission. Whoa. You know, to move forward with it. You know I'm gonna ask you to sing before we eat. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll sing with you, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. Wow, the song came on the 33rd day. Mm. Wow. Mm. And so then you bring it into our community. You've also brought, um, you know, in, in this masculine alchemy space, in the men's work, there's a lot of room for creativity, mm. you know? Yeah. And in the facilitation, it's not only in the ways that we get in there with men to allow them to move energy, 
and to confront their shadow, but really, like you said, setting the table for, for deep transformation. Yeah. It's also come in the form of something that's called brother death. Hey. It's another piece you really instilled into the culture, into the bones of what we do. Yeah. Could you speak a little about that? I never asked you. Yeah. Where, where did Brother Death come from? The first, and the first time I experienced it was with Kareem, mm -hmm. who had learned it from you. Yeah. And so this may be primarily interest, interesting for people who have experienced it, but maybe for someone who hasn't heard it. Mm -hmm. Talk about this, this ritual that, 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 is, that you've created and brought to our circle. So it's an adaptation of an uh, exercise that my teacher, Jamin McMillan, um, taught me in my somatic training at the Spatial Dynamics Institute, uh, just North Albany, New York. Um, I really feel that mystery plays are a way to communicate to the souls of humans. And I see it as a ritual, but also as a mystery play. It's, what is a mystery play? So like originally, like, you know, like the Greeks would present these mystery plays of the gods and their interactions with humanity. Um, and they create a portal, right? And, yeah. and that was my intention with bringing Brother Death forward in the, in the way that it, it is. The candles, you know, the gathering, the choosing to come into the field of life, right? Yeah. Most people think it's happenstance. It's like, yo, you chose to come here. Yeah. And maybe even under those circumstances, which are not so easy. Right. And so how do we come to terms with limits? You know, so much of our society refuses to accept limits. Or acknowledge death. Acknowledge death, and we saw that during <clears throat> COVID, right? What happens when all of a sudden it's like a more distinct possibility? Yeah. And so how do we create a culture that embraces death in a way that reinforces life and, uh, and a willingness to show up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and how, do we, how do we demonstrate things in a way that even a child can perceive mm. to take the complexity away? Walk the field of life, face brother death, right? And maybe you come to know him in a new way. Yeah, you know. To die today so that you can begin to become who you are to become tomorrow. Because this work of transformation, and when we're in those places, like when you first came in broken, isolated, you know what I'm saying? Mm. We have to like, we gotta, we gotta lay that down. And in order to lay that down, we actually have to like, have a, a symbolic death for it. Mm. This is the ritual of transformation, yeah? Yeah. And, and maybe in, in, in other cultures they have um, ways to do that. And so we're remembering that. Yeah. And so I love it, not only the creativity, but the courage. Mm. The courage that it takes to bring something forward, to create that in this now, knowing that our children may one day experience this ritual, mm. to sip the tea of Hawthorne, mm. like, phew. Yeah. That's, that's it's a, for me, this is a beautiful idea that we, we are cultural creators and that we have the permission to do that. Yeah. We give each other the permission to do that. Yeah, we do, you know. Um, when we met, it was kind of the whole height of the culture wars, right? Yes. Who, what belongs to who? And so for me, out of that space is I belong to the land, and that is where I can come from, where I can create from, and, and to do so with that courage. That courage comes from that willingness to show up and present myself to the land right. and to spirit and to move with that rather than, you know, popular opinion, you know? Yeah. And we, we feel it, you know, I felt it so much in Maui and, and uh, my, my first convergence, you know, we build this, this grid of life and it's, it's a portal and, and the worlds are watching, you know? We show up at Jakuma, they're waiting for us now. Welcome back, you know? We show up on Maui, they're like, thank you for coming again. Yes. You know, and, and that, to me, that presence becomes more and more visceral every time we come together in these good ways. Yeah. And you know, it's all a journey of the heart, which, the, which is the Hawthorne medicine. You know, when I finally did allow myself to do the research, um, you know, and I have some Celtic blood in me, it's an old Celtic medicine for purging ne negativity from the heart to clear yeah. away yeah. for what's real and living, you know? And uh, 
I believe, you know, I believe everyone has a unique medicine, you know, that can turn into culture when they slow down enough yeah. to listen. Yeah. I love how it's informed by the land. What belongs to who? It's a powerful question. Mm. We've never had this conversation, believe it or not. <laughs> but we're going to go there. Yeah. We're going to have the dread talk. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> I've had dreadlocks since I was 15 years old. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, when we talk about our ancestors, when we talk about being a human on this earth, when we talk about culture, mm. it comes to our body. Hey. Not only in the rituals that we participate in, mm. but the ritual that we are. Mm. And that comes in the form of tattoos and it comes in the form of dreadlocks, braids, hairstyles, yeah. things like this. Would you tell me about your dreadlock journey? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll share some man. of mine. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You know they're asking for it anyways. Who sure. are these two rosters talking? Sure. <laughs> How is it appropriate? Yeah. Um, you know, I was really blessed to live in two worlds growing up. Uh, my, with my mom, it was more that, you know, middle class, to upper middle class, uh, white lifestyle. Yeah. And with my dad always lived in black ghettos in Washington, D.C., and particularly um, in the early 90s, there were a lot of Caribbeans around. And they were the first ones, you know, I was an angry teenager always looking at the ground and they pick, they lift my chin and say, hey youth, a king looks out and forward to what's coming mm. so that he can make the appropriate decisions. You know, and, and with my own father being a, a questionable uh, role model, I really looked to these men. Yeah. And so I emulated them. You yeah. know? And then over the years, you know, a lot of time immersed in, in Rastafari culture, uh, you know, having elders there, uh, not only from the Caribbean, but also Africa. Yeah. You know, and just positive influences in my life. And, you know, nothing really feel like a, like a vinyl dance, you know, straight, strictly roots and yeah. consciousness, you yeah. know. And, I, and I, could, I could hear what I was already feeling inside in the music. You know, the consciousness that my soul was seeking was, was there. Yeah, um, and the love. Yeah, and I've always, you know, been a natural man in my earlier life. You know, I was an agriculturalist. Oh, okay. Um, also a stonemason. Always went to the wilderness for refreshment. And, you know, like a tree planted by the rivers of water, here I am. Do you feel uh, an ancestral connection through, through, through your hair, through, you know, through the journey? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and to be real, you know, it, it, it was Rastafari culture that brought me there, but then I come to do my research and it's like the Visigoths, the Celts, you know, the Greeks even. Yeah. Like, you know, the, and the, you know, and the Hindus. Um, yeah, and the Vedic traditions, the ascetics. Yeah, and it's, for me, it was just how I felt like me, you know? And I had frizzy, froey hair that was hard to deal with, and it just did it, you know? I used, I used to say that to people, like, people, it's so hard to have dreadlocks or something like this. I'm like, it's easier for me to have dreadlocks than to not have them. Yeah. You know, my hair is wanting to do this. Yeah. You know, on the real. Yeah. It's, it, it can be like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, you know? And the projection, but it probably wasn't all Rastas in support. You ever, you get the projections of the... Never from a Caribbean. Never from a Never Caribbean. Never once. That's kind of an American thing. S say more. Yeah, you know, the Caribbeans would call them coffee shop dreads. You know, those are the ones that want to call me out. Right. The ones who had been torn away and didn't have, you know, like, like in Jamaica with the Maroon people, they were free 300 years in the wilds of Jamaica to bring Rastafari culture forward. Yeah. Whereas here in America, it was like, you know, this, this need for identity was so to the fore that I might be an affront to that. Yeah. Uh, and I always say the same thing, you know. Um, you know, it, take, take time to know me. That's, yeah. You know, that's all, I, that's all I can ask. I love that, take time to know me. Yeah. Yeah, before you judge me. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'm not going to hold it, and I'm not going to change because of you. Yeah. My lineage also goes to Jamaica, and my experience. My sister ran away from home when she was 17. Uh, and she had went to barber school. And 
before she ran away from home, she gave me and my brother mohawks to piss my mom off. <laughs> she was running away because my mom and her were mm. really in it. And uh, I remember we went down in the basement and I'm like, she gave me a mohawk and she did an arrow at the bottom of mine. And uh, I thought it was the coolest thing ever that she had done that. And I remember walking up the basement stairs and her, there was luggage packed. But I was young, I was only seven. Oh, yeah. So I was young, I was in, I remember, I was like second, third grade. She gave me this mohawk, anyways, and my brother. I noticed the luggage, but I didn't make, it, make anything of it. And the next day she was gone. She didn't come back for seven years. I didn't see her for seven years. She came back. She had ran away to uh, Mexico, to TJ, Tijuana. Ended up in Miami, Florida. Met a Rasta, partnered up. Seven years later, she comes to my house. I'm living with my mom. And I opened the door to her. You know, we had heard she's coming home and things. And she has these dreads all the way down. It was like... Yeah, it's like looking on royalty. It was like that. Yeah. I'm just emotional. From yeah. Everything. And uh, I was like, I haven't seen her. The first thing I said to her was, Patty, can you do that to my hair? <laughs> Here I am, like, <laughs> 25 years later or whatever, you know. And then, <clears throat> even with tattoos, even with culture, it can be like that. It can be this instantaneous knowing of, man, that, that's who I am. And um, she has since cut her dreads. They, she grew them down long for years. But uh, yeah, it was that connection. I went to Jamaica, I hung with Peter. I got to eat mangoes from the trees down there. And special, yeah. special connection. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for sharing that, man. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting thing, you know? The, the projections that we have on other humans who are just doing their best, who are just feeling and listening to the land. And our culture has become, in ways, so conformist. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. In many ways, we praise the individual, but I think on a subconscious level, we praise conformity. And so, what does it mean to be a dread? What does that mean to you? What does it mean to walk with, to walk with the beautiful burden? Yeah, it means to be a, represent, a representative of spirit mm. and of land and to be the bridge between the two. You know? To me, that isn't the other primary function of the human being to be that bridge and to say, yeah, here I am on this land. And also check me, make sure I'm doing that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Make sure I'm living up to that. And just to be a natural man. Yeah. You know? What does it mean to you? To, what does it mean to be a natural man? If you're speaking to young men, mm. there's a young man watching this right now. He's, he felt that and he felt that when you said it. What mm. does that mean to you? Yeah, to me that's, you know, to listen to the breath, to listen to that first thought, that first intuitive thought, and to move with it. Yeah. It's to understand the scale of what we are part of and to look for our place in it. You know, where is our burden and where is our struggle and how does that lead us to our service? You know, to me, that's to be a natural man, to be in service to this place, yeah. all our relations. Oh. A natural mystic. Yeah. <laughs> a mystic man. <laughs> oh, man. The somatic piece. Mm. Man, one of the things I love <clears throat> that you bring. I haven't thought about this memory in so long, bro. It's never come through for me like that in like a long time. The somatic piece. You were one of the first persons I would talk about to, about my children, and I would, like you were like I was having trouble <clears throat> getting no one to sleep. Holland's a wild boy, and you had showed me just a couple things, and you talked about 
these tools where it's like, give him some pressure on his feet before bed, you know, walk it up the legs, like really make a ritual out of the, the bedtime ceremony. Mm -hmm. This was like, this was like a groundbreaking concept to me. Yeah. You know? Mm. How did somatic uh, therapy come into your life? And like, how did you become such a wizard? <laughs> <laughs> and, and tell me more about it, because I, I only know pieces of what I know. Yeah. You know, uh, somatics from soma, the Greek, for, for body. And that can really... Um, become isolated in thinking to a human body, but a planetary body, a tree body, you know, a collective body. And for me, it's a seeking of wholeness, you know? Yeah. Seeking for that ideal archetype that was present before the hurt, before the trauma. And I believe that's always present. You know, I was blessed enough um, to go to a somatic school that is really a mystery school. Oh, okay. The Spatial Dynamics Institute, which is rooted in a way in, in uh, anthropo anth uh, anthroposophic philosophy or the philosophies of Rud Rudolf Steiner, but not exclusively. You know, most people think of a human body as like a germ that grows up and out, but we look at it more like the land that has been carved by what's coming in, like the rivers carved the canyon, and that these forces, this ideal, this idea that Creator had, that is us, yeah. became the forces that came in and informed the land and is always present, that we then move away from. Yeah. And it's, it's, movement is the unifier, all life, right? Movement, even the mountains still rising, still crumbling. Yeah. No matter how fast or slow, movement is present. And so for me, it became the language of commonality. You know, I have a body, you have a body. That's, a, that's like the commons, you know? Right. That's what we share so we can find empathy. But there's also an individuality and almost like a karmic impression that creates a vessel that we need for our lessons. And my, um, my explorations were really guided by this idea of objectivity, not making an object out, out of the body, but listening without projection, listening with a total openness to what's already present and helping an individual follow those impulses. You know, like, like with sleep, for example, like people that struggle to sleep normally have those portals closed, their hands, because it's this little death. You are leaving the house, mm. right? People that um, are overly focused on physicality will have difficulty sleeping. Why is that? Because you got to go. The realms need to be traversed. You got to get out. Sleep. You got you to gotta be willing to surrender from your body. Is that yeah, kind of what you're saying? Exactly. You know, you need to be able to surrender from this earthly life for... That's interesting. I, I've, I've actually noticed that. Mm. Guys who are like at the gym all the time and probably taking a bunch of pre-workouts and caffeine and all kinds of stuff, but like mm. oftentimes have a hard time sleeping. Yeah, and what and do they insomnia. call them? Muscle bound. <sighs> <Right>? <sighs> yeah. Bound to the physicality. Yeah. Yeah, and this is like, you know, you see, we've seen, you know, sleeps, uh, sleep problems really increase dramatically over the past 10, 15 years. Yeah. As the society gets hyper materialistic, hyper uh, um, image oriented around physique and those things, that over identification from body, that moving further and further from the mystery, you're gonna have trouble sleeping. Yeah, and that's, that's not to say don't cultivate your temple. No. No, 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 no. And, like, everything in moderation, everything in, in harmony. Yeah. You know, and, you know, this is how we pray. We, 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 make, we make our workouts a prayer, you know? We're, <laughs> we're out there at dawn singing, yeah. giving praise before we do our first movements, you know? And so to orient that, and even to orient that, that refinement towards service, away from the self, but I'm making myself strong so that I'm able, you know, 
to work with these men for four days straight in intensity. You know, I'm making myself able so I can be there for my children. I'm making myself able so I can be there for my community, right? Not just so I can look hot. <laughs> yeah. Who do we do it for? Who do we do it for? Who do we do it for? Hey. We do it for the ancestors. We do. We do it for each other. We do it for our brothers. Hey. For creator and the earth. For creator and the earth. Yeah. That's why I love this brotherhood so much. You know, we remind each other that. You know, we sing it. Yeah. We are it. And we see a brother who's moving away from that. We say, hey, brother, come back in. We're ready for you. You know, we'll help you remember. Will you help me to remember when I forget? Yeah. Please. I need it. Yeah. yeah. The remembrance has been such a theme um, in our circles. Do you have a moment of your own kind of spiritual awakening? And do you, or do you have, do you have a moment of remembrance that, that stands out for you on your journey? Yeah, you know, really my earliest memory, I was about five and uh, we were at uh, Valley Forge in Pennsylvania. Uh, yeah. which is where, you know, the, the American troops overwintered and almost, you know, met their demise until the rivers broke and the salmon ran. And I was sitting by some water and this uh, blue woman raised up out of the waters. What? <laughs> what? Yeah, I like, see my hair is standing up, like, you know? <laughs> and that whole day, I'm this little kid and I'm terrified because I'm seeing soldiers everywhere. I'm seeing old camps. And so, I knew not everything was as it seemed. And at, even as, like, I remember five, six, seven, eight, nine years old, always seeking quiet places to watch laying under the trees and just watching and noticing the change in me. Yeah. Knowing that I could find a, a resource in those places. Yeah. So the mystery's been tugging at my sleeve for a long time. So bring it back to the present, back to the body. Mm. What is it about the somatic piece? And I, I want to just emphasize this because you are a practitioner and this is, this is a part of the, the gift that you bring. Could you say a little bit more about, maybe not techniques, but about just the, the philosophy mm. and on the laying of the hands and, and how that's important? We do a lot of it in the men's work, mm -hmm. um, but this is a unique skill set that you have. Yeah. So with the laying of hands, we can do effective material things, massage, um, you know, acupressure, those kind of things. But as we refine our awareness, we can begin to note that there are subtle pulses, subtle rhythms that the anatomy has. Comings and goings, we'll call them. The way the body moves out and comes back in. And uh, I'm always looking for a rhythmic tide and for the intertwining of spirals on, in the subtle forces, which are astral and etheric forces. You can think of astral forces of what radiates out yeah. And the etheric is the, the formative, the informative, what's coming in. Um, and those rhythms need to be in time with each other. It begins with technique, right? My teacher uh, brought me beautiful techniques. And when the technique is mastered, then it becomes a deeper listening. And we allow ourselves to be a witness of what's needed. Right, and I think that's, as a practitioner, it's important to take that time because we might not know. And I always like when I reach that point, it, I'm like, I don't know what to do for this person, but yeah. I know who does. And so to get out of the way in, in, a, in a listening way has led me to these, these refinements and perceptions of, of forces unseen. Um, yeah. And it creates an invitation like we do. Um, if, you, if you think if like the subtle space around the body collapsed in on a muscle and it can't move, it's gonna spasm. Yeah. And you know, we could push in or we could just create the space again like we do yeah. and allow that invitation 
to be a, a space that the body moves towards because it, re it remembers, oh, that's my home. Yeah. In ease. Okay. So I love to give practical examples and tools mm -hmm. like when we talk. I mentioned this piece around putting my, my sons to sleep and you had dropped some gems like that. Mm. Since we talked about sleep, what are, what's like a somatic practice mm. that maybe parents can do for children or like uh, partners can do for each other? Things like that. So we, we just give something practical somebody wanted to, to test the waters. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would start with the hands, right? We so naturally go there when we want to support someone, want to connect, we hold their hand. Yeah. And the, the palm itself is a, is a portal, it's an exit. And so one way, if you're having trouble sleeping, notice if you're curling into the body and you can just begin to send yourself away, even imagine a horizon, get beyond the room just with your awareness. Begin to send yourself away from the body. Say, you know, may the protections that I need be with me in those spaces beyond me. Yeah. You know. Um, that's a, that's a practical tip. Beautiful. I also, we, we do a lot of like cleansing and clearing stuff, you know what I'm saying? Like energetic clearing. I think that's also kind of a lost art. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's cause it's not all about running and lifting, running and lifting. Yeah. 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 And that's where rhythm comes in. And one of the reasons why I love functional patterns, primal reset so much is because it's in these rhythms of walking, running and throwing these natural rhythms. And it's, it's in the, in the, in those rhythms that we find our true nature, you know, um, when we get out of the checklist of how many reps did I do, but did I find the rhythm that brought me to a greater awareness of myself and my place in the world. Rhythm, not reps. Rhythm, not reps. <laughs> That's bars. See how this, we do? This, could, this is actually applicable to a lot of this work that we trained in. Yeah. You know, here with Sacred Sons at Leadership Training, I mean, we're here to get reps and we're here to get synchronized. We're here to get that rhythm yeah. and that collective sync because we're, we're sending men all over the world to lead and to facilitate in this work. How has it been for you to be here this weekend on leadership training, both as a student and a teacher? It's been amazing, man. You know, um, first of all, just deeply honored, you know, mm -hmm. to be lifted uh, and witnessed by you brothers and yeah. utilized, you know? I just, I wanna be useful and you, and you guys have made me useful. I really appreciate that you know, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> And you know, it's like when I'm, when I'm talking to men about leadership and running their own, you know, their own events and they're getting bogged down in, you know, the outline or whatever it is. It's just like, look for the anchors that bring you home and then allow yourself to expand out from there. And those anchors become that rhythm. And that's why we have standards of presence because they create that foundational rhythm, right? We're gonna play it in four, we're gonna play it in six, you know, whatever it is. Um, but that's the importance of structure, I think is undervalued, you know? That's where we find, if we can't find the discipline within ourselves, we can find it in the rhythms that we establish with our day, with our families, within an organization, right? Yeah. We know, you know, we know when it's time for primal re recalibration. Oh yeah. And we get ready for that, you know? I wake up with that, you know? It's like today's that day, I'm getting ready and it, 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 the rhythm of the day itself becomes a drawing force of bringing forth our medicine, I yeah. believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like this idea, the rhythm for the day. Like to, to, to consciously come into the rhythm of self, yeah. you know, instead of just like jump starting the motor down in the coffee, out the door. Yeah. But to like actually find that rhythm for the day, even if that means you need to wake up and scream into a pillow. Yeah. Even if that means you need to get up and do them push-ups or do the do the yoga, do the stretching. Yeah. To find to always be attuned to find our rhythm more than the somewhat monotony of reps. Yeah. And what I find with not only the monotony of reps, but what it can do inside a person's uh, view of self, I think it can, because if we don't hit those numbers, I feel like I've seen a lot of men, it turns into a shame spiral. I didn't hit my markers. I am therefore less than. Right. Where right. I, you know. 
where this rhythm is like, get back in. Get back in. <laughs> this is how we do it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what's up. I want to I wanna stay here on leadership. Um, you know, you're a leader in our Pacific Northwest region. You have led many EMXs, immersions, at this point, all around the country. Mm -hmm. um, you got the EMX in Washington coming up. Where's that one going to be at? Yeah, we're going to be uh, at Camp Parsons in Brennan, out on the peninsula, beautiful place, right on the Hood Canal. Um, just a, a mystical, magical place. That's May 18th to the 21st. Um, it's just one of those, you know, the, it was waiting for us, you know? Yeah. I was out there with a brother first time, just checking it out, you know, and getting a little bit of a, a little bit of smudge up and the eagle screams and we say, okay, that's all the, that's all we need. Yeah. You know, and so we're in there. Yeah. Couple of eagles in that story, huh? Uh, you got, you got Kale, you got the eagle to the Hawthorne, you got the eagle to the EMX site. And then we're going to be flying even further north, you and I both, up to Vancouver That's right. for the BC 100. Vancouver, we're calling in 100 men to be with us in Vancouver. Camp Arbatan. Camp Arbatan. Yeah, Gambier Island. On Gambier Island. Yeah, July 5th to the 9th. Yeah, I want to say, send a special shout out to our Canadian brothers who I know are watching. And I know you haven't been able to cross the border and come get with us uh, in the lower 48. And so this is an opportunity. Like I said, we're calling in 100 men to EMX in Vancouver. That's July. It's like the first week in July. Yeah, July, July 5th, 5th through 9th. 9th. Yeah. July 5th through 9th. Both Hunter Torin and myself will be there alongside our brothers Jason, Matt. Who else? Super G. Super Graham's going to be there. Man Align brothers show up. We want to see you. Yeah. Yeah, man. What does it mean to you to be a leader of this global movement, bro? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about this this morning, you know, and it's wild what happens when there's a harmonic resonance of the prayers of strangers, which we were. Yeah. You know, but there yeah. was recognition upon meeting, which I believe was in that harmonic resonance. Our prayer was the same to uplift mankind. Yeah. To find a way to our own healing and through that serve. You know, it's, it, it's, it's beyond what I could have imagined, you know. Um, the honor is truly humbling, you know. And I'm, um, it gives me to have something to pray for, to have something to prepare for that is of that magnitude is such a blessing in my life, you know. It's like, yeah. keep that bar high, keep it high. Oh, you can eat, eat a little higher, Yeah. you know? Um, the Pacific Northwest itself is just so mystical. Yeah. So much memory. You know, we say, uh, you know, water is the carrier of memory, right? And here we have a land that's encompassed with mist eight months of the year. How much memory is alive there, you know? How much is, is, is ready to serve us to serve what is needed in that place now. Yeah. You know, um, wow. What yeah. A, what a thing. So you said that you were called in by my voice, mm. calling in the lone wolves. I want to give you the opportunity to do that right now. How would you want to call in men to the Pacific Northwest, to Oregon, to Seattle, to Vancouver, to BC 100? What's your call in? You know, brothers, I would say there's no need to do it alone. You know, the work that's needed, the development that's needed, we want to support you. We're here to support you through your, you know, through your struggle to your triumph. We want to excavate that medicine, that magic that you are. Bring it to the community. Bring it to your families, you know. Um, if you get in that hit and, and if that hesitation's there, break through that first barrier, that invitation, all of you is welcome. And I mean mm. that every bit of you is welcome, <laughs> which is the first thing this brother said to me, you know, <laughs> in person on the banks of EO. Oh. And it's true, man. I found it to be true. All of you is welcome. Hey. And all of you are welcome. Hey. All of you are welcome to this movement. Yeah. 
I feel so emotional sitting in this energy that we've been in of leadership training and just like to, to really witness how far we've come and how far Sacred Sons has expanded. Mm. We're coming to Europe. We're coming to Australia. We come. We're coming to Africa. We're coming home, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the call in. Yeah. Men, listen, I am a, I'm a witness to, I get to be a witness to so many miracles in this work. And I, I just want to piggyback on top of what you said by saying, this work is for all men. All men can benefit from this. To be seen, to be witnessed, to be heard, to be raised up. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Yeah. It's as simple as that. With that, Hunter, is there any piece that you'd like to leave, any piece of yourself that you would like to leave on this 49th year of our brother on his birthday? Leave, bless us up with a gift. Leave us with a gift. Yeah, you know, beginning of a new seven-year cycle here. Um, know that it's a special time to be alive and that, and that you chose it and that you are honored by the heavens and the earth in that choosing and that you will find support when you move towards your most authentic self. That there is a depth to you that is beyond what you can imagine, so make room for that. Make room for the unknown, get uncomfortable in the unknown mm. so that it can become uh, a place of solace even. Yeah. Because when we enter it, we're then free to receive our genius and move from that place, yeah. each and every one. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Each one, teach one. Be willing to step into the unknown. With that, we will see you at EMX Washington, EMX Vancouver, BC 100. Show up, brothers. All for one and one for all. All is one, one is all. Calling out to them and those who for the harm are none and the good of all. Come in. <laughs> we waiting. And with that, Hunter Torin, Adam Jackson, Sacred Sons for Life. My brother. Oh, love you, bro. Love you. Thank you. Thank you so much, man. Mm, happy birthday. <laughs>